for um, for drinking with historians. So, but my favorite thing is last week uh, we had Yakov on, and he messaged me uh, a couple hours before. He's like, "What's the dress code?" And I was like, uh, "You just have to wear clothes." <laughs> <laughs> Please wear clothes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> please. please. I don't want to have to click that when we upload it to YouTube, that click that I, adult content. Yeah, button. I don't, so want to, don't want to have to do that. Yeah. We're not going to do that, yeah. We want yeah. everything suitable for uh, for children here. Well, maybe not. Sometimes we, we have some foul language, but, uh, but that's and then okay. children and pitter-patter by, right? So you see yeah. that that's right. That's right. <laughs> and I think this time, Matt, your background has mine beat. You're, if you if you want to tell people who are joining in why you have Klimt behind you. Sure, yeah, I'm joining you from a secure location, um, not <laughs> my, my home <laughs> where we usually are, but um, I'm actually at an Airbnb um, elsewhere for, for a weekend getting together with, with some friends and um, it's my wife's birthday, uh, well, it was my wife's birthday yesterday. Um, and so we're kind of celebrating that way. And so I'm squirreled off in one corner of the Airbnb while they're all enjoying having snacks and, and drinks, but but I'm drinking too. So it's the joke's on them. So anyway, yep. yes. And, and this yeah. is this this lovely Klimt I was I was saying to everybody um, before everybody joined is that this is not a print. This is like on the wall, like somebody commissioned an artist to come in and recreate um, the kiss. And, and I figured like that's the perfect background, especially since I, I'm dressed all fancy. So, I agree. I yeah. agree. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I would like to say that I chose my tie to match it, but uh, it's just kind of luckily. It luckily just kind happened. of luck. Like, yeah, kind of happens. So. Yeah. Anyway, um, well, maybe we should we should get going instead of kind of continuing to talk about me because we have um, Dr. Stephanie Jones Rogers joining us, who is much more interesting than than any Varsha and I. Like, no offense, Varsha, but but I think that's yeah, actually true. Definitely, yeah, definitely. No, I totally definitely agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, if people don't know, we have Dr. Jones Rogers with us today. She's an associate professor at of history at UC Berkeley. She specializes she specializes in African American history, in history of women, in the history of gender, uh, as well as the history of slavery in America. Um, so her prize winning book is They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. So she's won multiple prizes for this. Um, and it's a brilliant book. And so she's here to talk about this book, as well as uh, another book project that she's working on now. Um, and we're really excited to have her, uh, mainly because I've, I've taught for her before when she taught the history of women uh, in America, and it was a great class. And so I'm excited to to talk to you today. Uh, and yeah, so I think we'll, we'll start with the most important question of the day. Uh, what are you drinking today, Stephanie? I am drinking the malt liquor of wines, Moscato. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious, but nevertheless, you know, you can get a huge bottle for $9.99. <laughs> That's amazing. Best drink choice. Yes. What that, about that you, is you, Matt? That is that is the best description of Moscato I've, I've ever heard in my life, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna shamelessly steal that um, whenever we whenever we drink that. So, um, so I have I have some I have some whiskey, I have some scotch today, I have some Talisker Ten, um, which is just kind of lovely and smooth and stuff like that. I have to uh, thank my friend um, James Palmer, who, who lives in Scotland, teaches at University of St Andrews, who I visited and introduced me to it. Love it. It's my it's my scotch of choice. So, uh, what about you, Rachel? What are you drinking today? Uh, I am drinking uh, Cape May White, which is a Belgian style wheat with coriander and orange peel. Ooh, yeah, that fancy. sounds lovely, especially like on a, is it, is it warm there in Philly? It is, yeah. Yeah, it's not as bad nice as summer summer last week, but it's still pretty warm. Yeah, so, all right, Varsha, what about you? I, I got a gift today because people have finally realized the way to my heart is to buy me bourbon. Uh, so somebody <laughs> bought me, um, I actually bought this brand's rye a couple of days ago, but we'll talk about it later. But this is Leopold Bro's um, uh, straight uh, bourbon whiskey. It's bottled in bond uh, and it's really, really good. It's my first time having it. It's, you can basically smell the cinnamon, you can smell the toffee. Um, and there's like a little bit of spice in there because I think, um, because it's bottled in Colorado, all of the, um, all of the mash that they use for it, it's like their corn, malted barley, uh, as well as rye, it's all grown in Colorado. So I'm excited. It's really good. That's fantastic. Excellent. So, all right. So thank you very much, Rachel. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, please remember, um, Rachel will be monitoring the Q&A and in the second half hour, we'll be happy to take um, your questions for, for Dr. Jones Rogers. Um, but until then, I mean, we have some questions and we have a lovely conversation, I think that we're going to have right now. So, but thank you, Rachel. And we'll say goodbye to her right now. 
And um, so I guess the first question, um, uh, Stephanie, if you, you don't mind me calling you Stephanie, is yeah. um, so your book, and, and Varsha said like an award-winning book, but again, like that's kind of short selling it. Like, you know, there's a list of awards your book has rightfully and deservedly, of course, won um, over the course of the year. So why did you decide to, to focus on this particular project, right, about um, the, the role of women in slave ownership in America? So I started this project, I would say, by accident. Um, because when I initially went into graduate school, which is where I started this project, um, I planned to complete a dissertation on victims of lynching. So female victims of lynching, mm -hmm. there were um, about 30 of them who had been um, lynched because they had been accused of murdering their white male employers. And I was really interested in what was going on behind the scenes underneath the kind of, you know, the, the kind of underneath the fabric of this, of these, of these cases. And so I planned to do this project. Um, but before I could get there, of course, as you know, as Varsha knows, you know, you have those hurdles to jump. So I had to take, you know, get get through those exams that are those, you know, those hurdles um, that we have to jump before we can really get our hands dirty in the research. And so when I was doing that, you know, I, I really became quite frustrated um, by what I saw as a disconnect between these two two fields that I was I was studying at the time, which was you know African American history, which is my specialization, and in some ways my minor um, women's history particularly white Southern women's history. And so I found that there was what seemed to be a disconnect around the question of whether white women and particularly white married women could have an economic investment um, in the institution of slavery, whether they could hold enslaved people um, you know, in their own right, legally in their own right as their own property, um, they were her property, <laughs> um, if they could buy and sell them and hire them or rent them, um, and, and also to receive the benefits, the, the, the financial benefits of, of those those transactions. Mm. And so, you know, the two, those two subfields seem to have a very different answer to that question. Um, you know, African American history and historians that focused on on that field, you know, said sure they could. You know, they did all the time, you know, and they, you know, yeah. would often give those voices. Um, you know, basically corroborating the, those assertions. And then, you know, those those um, individuals who focused on white Southern women said, not really. You know, if they did have mm -hmm. an economic investment in slavery, it was indirect, meaning it was typically through some male kin, you know, kinfolk, um, uh, a husband or, uh, you know, a father or an uncle or some some male kin, kinsman in their, in their lives. Um, and so that was the way that they could have an economic investment, but really their investments were cultural and ideological and social um, and, and not necessarily, and, and also of course the labor, um, the physical element of it, but not necessarily an economic investment. And so I was frustrated and wanted to kind of get at, you know, the get to the bottom of this. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, you know, set out on a kind of quest to, to, to answer that question, you know, whether, you know, whether these African-American historians in particular um, and these African-Americans, um, formerly enslaved African-Americans that they often quoted and cited, um, whether they were right, whether these women did mm. indeed have an economic investment in the institution of slavery. And so the, the dissertation and thus the book um, is, is the kind of the fruit of that, that, that um, quest. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. It, well, I mean, it, like how many, like, I mean, we've heard this kind of repeatedly when we've had guests on uh, is, is people stumble into things. And yeah. especially, I love what you were kind of saying is that like, especially when you're working interdisciplinarily, inter interdisciplinarily kind of between fields, it's like you yeah. see these kind of disconnect in ways that different people are answering questions and you try to figure out like, well, why aren't they, why aren't they talking to each other? Why aren't they saying the same kind of thing? What sources are they looking at? And, and going back to the sources is, is always yes. so fruitful. So. Yes, and the sources were really important here because um, these two subfields were using different sets of sources, primarily different sets yeah. of sources, and so that's primarily why they came to a different set, you know, set of answers, or they came to different answers um, in relationship to that question. So the sources were really important for me. Yeah. Um, when we had uh, we had Amy Stanley on, and she was talking about when she does Japanese history about you know believing her sources, uh, but one of the difficult things about uh, using um, you know, the oral history sources of African Americans, formerly enslaved African Americans, is that uh, there is a chance that some of their answers may have been, if not coached, or like, you know, they may have been afraid to give the true answer. So when you, you when you're using those oral history interviews that mm. were taken during the New Deal, how did you sort of deal with um, the conflict with those sources, as well as the conflict with using like, white women as, as sources? 
So that's a really excellent question. And it was such a frustrating one in the beginning <laughs> when I started this project, because, you know, I started where I thought I started in, in the, the most obvious place, in my opinion, which was with uh, the diaries and the letters of these white Southern women. And I wanted, you know, I thought that they were going to just be chatting up a storm, you know, mm -hmm. about their economic investments in the institution. Yeah. Oh, I bought a slave today or I sold the slave today. I thought they would just be talking about it all the time and they weren't talking about it all the time, you know, rarely did they talk about it, but they talked about it, but it was rare that they did. And, you know, I, at first I was, you know, disheartened and frustrated. <laughs> and so then I said, but maybe, maybe I should go back to the roots of this thing, which is, you know, the roots of this thing, which, which was in African-American history and see what sources they're using to get at this question. What sources are they relying upon, um, you know, to tell us, you know, yes, these women were economically invested in the institution. And so they were using, um, as you referred to, Varsha, the WPA narratives, these interviews that were conducted by federal, the federal government in the 1930s and 40s with formerly enslaved people, the ones, at least the ones that they could find. Um, because there were many more that they couldn't find um, to interview. Um, and so when I looked at those sources, um, yes, I, uh, of course, had heard the caution, you know, had read about, you know, the caution that um, we should, you know, use um, when approaching these sources, when um, relying upon these sources. But I, I'm also in the back of, you know, in the back of my mind, and you know this, Varsha, um, from, from the yeah. class that we we, uh, we worked it together and um, I'm also a, a, a petty detective, you know, as I've been recently um, crowned a petty detective. So I love forensic <laughs> science shows. I love, you know, murder show, you know, murder shows that help, you know, by the time the show is over, you can solve the crime with, you know, along with the cops. And, and so I really think those, those skills kicked in because then I began to think of how can I, okay, I know that these sources are problematic for scores of historians, not all historians. They weren't necessarily problematic for me, but they were, they are, they continue to be problematic mm -hmm. for many historians. And so I wanted to kind of to, to, to deal with that um, by, you know, how, how was I going to deal with that? That was the question. My, the, the question, I answered the question by saying, well, what would, a, what would a detective do? What would a journalist do if they only had this one source and they knew that source was problematic or that source might not be 100% reliable? What would they do in those circumstances? And so I looked elsewhere. I looked to the sources that historians are obviously more comfortable with, um, you know, um, financial documents mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that um, supported the idea that white women did in fact buy and sell enslaved people, um, that they were the legal owners of those enslaved people that were at the, the core of those transactions. I looked at, um, you know, when it came to the military, I looked at military correspondence where there are letters that supported these women saying, this is my slave, not my husband's slave, not this person's mm -hmm. slave, my slave, and I want them back, they're in your camp, et cetera. I looked at, um, wills um, and wills of, of not just the women, but also the women's relatives to see if yeah. they were bequeathed. Um, so there were a whole variety of sources that weren't the WPA narratives that I was able, I was able to use in relationship to, in conversation with the WPA narratives to corroborate um, even the census, for example, the census was a wonderful and rich resource um, that helped me to connect the dots between the owner and the own. So if an enslaved person said, well, my mistress's name was, you know, Mary Smith, and she lived in Louisville, Kentucky in 1845, you know, I would go to the, or 1855, I would go to the, the census, and I would be able to find Mary Smith in the mm. census and show that she did indeed have enslaved people um, as part of her property holdings. So I was, I, I was forced um, to go kind of to start small and then move outward um, to, to kind of build um, outward um, and to incorporate all these other sources in order to, to, to substantiate what I really wanted to do was legitimate and substantiate what enslaved people were saying and formerly enslaved people were saying, even though I don't think we should have to do that. I knew that there were going to be colleagues and peers who wanted me to do that. So I did that in this book so that the, the argument, um, the assertions could be unassailable or at least cl as close to unassailable as possible. So I did that by you know um, building on all these other um, sources that historians use um, quite frequently and regularly. Yeah. 
Um, I was kind of struck by, by something you said, Stephanie, about, um, you know, you expected the white women, the, you, the objects of your study, kind of to be chatty about this, that they were talking about, like, you know, I owned a slave, I did this thing with my slave or something like that. And they weren't, they, they weren't saying those things. So, you know, and, and then the way that you pieced it together by kind of a little bit here, a little bit there, like moving across different sources and then kind of building a picture, like you said, like, like a detective or like a journalist, like building a case almost. Um, you know, because, you know, in, in pre-modern sources, for example, we have like a really limited source base. And so we were forced to do this kind of, you know, similarly, um, like, how do you, how do you kind of generally deal? Or do you think that's like, I guess my question is more, if I'm, I'm trying to formulate a question here is, is like, why were they so reticent about talking about this? So uh, yet another really um, great question. I, I, I frame their, um, the lack of conversation or the lack of discussion about this issue, not as reticence, but as, as banality. So this is simply on a daily yeah. basis, this is, they are, these are women who yeah. from the time they were infants grew up in households shaped and defined by slavery. Okay. Shaped by, you know, so this is a culture of slavery, a culture of, of violence, a culture of, you know, um, the, yeah. the slave economy permeated every aspect of their lives. And so this was like nothing. <laughs> you know, it, we think of, of, of the sale of a human being as just a, an extraordinary, stunning, remarkable, astonishing, you know, um, event that must be recorded. Um, and of course they were recorded, but for these women, it was a banal event um, mm -hmm. to, hire, to hire Sally to, you know, the mother down, down the way who needed a wet nurse for her infant. That was a banal event for that mistress. Um, and so because of that, because it was such a part of the everyday, they didn't, they didn't feel the need to write about it in their diaries um, on a routine basis, on a regular mm -hmm. basis. When you do see it written about is when it was an extraordinary set of circumstances, when, you know, there's a huge chunk of money involved that they wouldn't ordinarily put out you know, for, to buy slates or, you know, some, some kind of, you know, um, family um, conflict um, was evolving around a certain number of enslaved people, et cetera. So when it was a remarkable set of circumstances, a crisis, typically an economic crisis or uh, something that could lead to an economic or a legal crisis um, within the family, then you see them writing about it. Um, but, but when it was a, just a run of the mill sale or transaction, um, that you know wasn't out of the ordinary. They really didn't talk, write about them, um, write about those incidents uh, much at all. That's, been, that's one, phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that Sorry. interested me when I had to read when I had to read the book is uh, how so many white women used African Americans or used enslaved women as as wet nurses, right? Just because in my head I couldn't reconcile the fact that at the same time these white women as well as white men are thinking that African Americans are less than. But at the same time, they're entrusting these women to not only, mm. you know, feed their children, but also take care of them and like literally raise them. And so when you were doing your research and writing this, like how were white women justifying this of like this racial distinction of like less than for African-American women, but at the same time saying, yeah, you deserve to feed my child for months. So they they rec reconciled, you know, this issue, um, the issue of cross cross racial wet nursing, um, in a series of ways, in a number of ways. So first, you know, some of them they needed they needed a wet nurse because of medical necessity. They mm -hmm. had some, you know, um, some many many women suffered from um, a condition called mastitis, which is an infection in the mammary gland, and it prevents you know them from having sufficient milk production. So they mm -hmm. they had to rely on women to wet nurse their children um, because of medical necessity. Or there are other women who didn't suffer from mastitis but still had insufficient milk supply. So they needed women to supplement the, the milk supply that they were able to produce, if any at all. So that's that was kind of like, you know, one really important reason why they would do this. Others just simply um, didn't, didn't care because wet nursing was a commonplace practice. Um, although it wasn't typically a commonplace practice across racial lines. In the North, for example, it was mm. cross-ethnic. So for example, there were oh. white women and in, in native born white women in the, in the North who wet nurse, who, um, who you know, um, hired 
Irish women to wet nurse their children or German women to wet nurse their children. And there was all this, conver there was a, a lot of conversation in the North about the pseudoscientific conversation about whether this was a good idea <laughs> because the, the ethnic or racial essence of the mother would be passed through the milk to the infant. Uh -huh. And so there were all these you know, male doctors who at this moment are trying to become, um, they're trying to legitimate their, their power, their authority as, as doctors, um, you know, professionals. Um, they, they, you know, take a stake, they ha have a stake in this, in this game because they want people to listen to them. So they are writing all this advice about, about this. And so they say to these women, okay, if you use a, a, a an Irish, you know, wet nurse or a German wet nurse, make sure that this, that it's, that your, it's your last resort. So many of the women in the South, when they wrote about this practice, did write about this practice as though it was a last resort. Then of course, there was the other category of women who simply said, I, don't, I just, I don't know how to rationalize it because I mean, we are really, we are saying that these people are not the same kind of humans as we are, that they're inferior beings or inferior human beings. So. I just, I can't reconcile it, so I'm not going to try. And so what they essentially did was they developed strategies to try to separate the women who, who nurse their children from the rest of the enslaved population. So I give an example in the, in the book for, um, um, about a woman who decided, okay, the problem wasn't necessarily that the woman was Black, it was that the woman was enslaved. So they freed the woman so that the woman could nurse her child. There was another instance in which um, they, they found that the problem wasn't that the woman was black or enslaved, but that the that the woman lived in the quarters with the rest of the enslaved population. Oh. So they made they made her they removed her from the slave quarters and brought her into the household. And so her only work was to wet nurse her her own child and the white child, the white infant. So this was when they couldn't reckon reconcile um, this practice, they simply developed strategies on the ground. To make themselves a little bit more comfortable with the practice, and they they took it, and then at the end of it, they they just hid it, you know. Like I, you know, I, I also give an example of a woman who just kind of hid, you know, the fact that she was she was actually using an enslaved wet nurse. Um, but it was, you know, as you know, in the papers. Um, so there was really no way of hiding the fact that there was this great demand for these women. Yeah, wow. it's it's really interesting too. It seems like um, you know, kind of how you're describing it is that, and as you kind of answered my previous question, is that the banality of this tradition, right? It was just something that, like, for a lot of people, it seemed like that that's that's what that's what people did. So, like, there wasn't there might be an intellectual disconnect if you really kind of thought about it, but because it was just something that that happened, that's what it is, right? And looking back, historians can kind of point out the horror and the and the kind of disjunction, but. It, to, be, to these particular people at this time, they didn't think about it like kind of in this way. Um, right. So, yeah, and I, I, so I did wanna, you know, we wanna, we have some great questions in the Q and A and we're gonna get to those in, in just a few minutes, but I did wanna, if I could like ask about your next project, because, you know, as I understand it, you're kind of pulling back and you're talking about kind of the role of women in kind of the British Atlantic uh, slave trade kind of more generally, kind of, can you, can you kind of give us an overview of kind of what you're thinking like as this project is, is developing? Yeah, so I'm super excited about this project. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, when you read about the British slave trade and, you know, I'm, I speak English, I do not speak a second language. Unfortunately, I should speak a second language. I know that. So I'm just prefacing that for the historians, the hoity-toity historians in the, <laughs> in the virtual Hi. room. Um, but so I, you know, I should know, but, but so that's one of the reasons why if one of the questions comes up, why this is about, this project is about the British slave trade. Um, I'm, I'm handicapped in some ways, so I'm working with what I have. Okay, um, so when you read sources about the, the British slave trade, when you read you know, new scholarship as it comes out about the British slave trade, um, it's so interesting to me that very few, very few sources, very few books um, are in, in very little, very little of the scholarship it includes women as um, kind of the movers and shakers in the trade. And, mm -hmm. You know, my stumbling, I'd, I'd gone to London, um, I think two years ago, I went to the National Archives and I'm in, in the National Archives and I was actually working on a completely different project. And I accidentally, yet again, <laughs> stumbled upon um, this passenger list. And it's a passenger list of basically, um, you know, there were at, at the time, there were hundreds of, of English women um, in these passenger lists and they were going to West Africa. 
and they were going to West Africa on slave ships owned by the Royal African Company. I was just like, what the heck is going on, you know? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I've got to look into this. So, you know, I'm in London for two weeks. I'm like, well, actually I was, I was there for a month, but I only have two weeks left. And so I'm just like, I'm going to just put this in a folder and I'm going to look into it when I get home, you know, because right now this is not what I'm here for. <laughs> And so, you know, it, it really spawned kind of another, another quest, you know, because I said, well, okay, if these women are going to West Africa, what else are they doing? What else, how else are they involved in the slave trade? And so, of course, you know, there has been uh, work done by Maria Van in particular on um, women, female slave, uh, slave ship owners. So she's written a master's thesis on women who, um, white women who own slave ships. So I know that they mm -hmm. own slave ships. Um, but, but then I started to find out that they, they not only owned slave ships, but they helped to outfit the, the slave the slave ships. Oh. So they gave, you know, they, they equipped the slave ships with the, the trade goods that were being sent to West Africa in exchange for enslaved people. They were investing as subscribers. So they were investors in the Royal African Company. I'm looking at those records right now. Um, again, they were in West Africa, typically with family, you know, male family members who were employed um, in the Royal African Company, but they were also there as single women um, working for the Royal African African company. And of course, there were um, African women and Afro English women, so mixed race women who were the children of um, African women and English um, traders who were on the coast. Um, and these women are interacting with the English women who are a part of this whole process. So I am, I'm, I'm working on a project that kind of takes the, it takes the shape of a slave ship journey you know, starting in England, moving its way along the coast of West Africa, oh. getting to the Caribbean and to the uh, into British North America, and then kind of taking it back to um, Britain when the, the goods are sold. And basically showing um, and centering the experiences of English, Afro-English and African women um, throughout that entire journey in the various elements of the trade um, that, that, that journey, um, you know, that the, the, the journey represents. So that's what the, um, second book, uh, women of the trade, um, will, will be doing. Um, and I'm hard at work on that right now. and I'm very excited about it. I just saw that you were, uh, you tweeted about, uh, requesting documents from the Q archives. Yeah. Yes. That's my, it's my favorite. I wish, is it open right now? Like, are you actually going go to go to It is open. I am, I don't know when, <laughs> but I just want this one document. And so, you know, and I was just like, for those of you who are, you know, lose hope because at one o'clock in the afternoon, you remember, I need that document from yeah. that, from Q, you know, don't lose heart, wake up at one o'clock in the morning. Like I did. <laughs> I, I know, have a soft document. spot. I have a soft spot for Q because uh, when I was an undergraduate, I decided that I was going to, you know, do this project on British history education in England. And I go up to my professor and I'm like, okay, so um, do I actually have to go to, to England to do this? He's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, damn. And then I, you know, <laughs> I, I managed to, because this is before I was an American citizen. So I only had a green card. So I needed a visa. I needed funding and I needed a place to stay. I managed to get it all done. And then I show up in England in January and I'm like freaked out. Cause I'm like, I have never been to an archive before. I am 20 years old. What am I doing with my life? But then I just made it to Q one day, the first day. And I'm like, this is the most magical place I've ever seen. So I have a very <laughs> soft spot for Q. It's hard to, um, it's hard to leave once you get there, right? It's hard yeah, to leave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask the, the really good audience question, and it's like a, a really important theme in your book. Uh, Sharon asks about married women owners and how they got around women's legal identity, right? So she's basically yes. talking about coverture. Sure. And so that's right. something that I found really interesting in the book as well, is like, how exactly did women, white women specifically, get around coverture? Did coverture just end one day? Like a Southern state was like, okay, no more coverture. Or was it like a long process that took like a bunch of different court cases? Mm. Like, how do they actually get around coverture? So that that question I've been um, you know kind of grappling with. Um, I grappled with that question for for many years, um, and it was Tom Lacour, as you know, many of you will know who Tom Lacour is, and he was just like, look, you know, you just you, you can try to get around this question, but you're going to have to answer this question, so you might as well figure it out. Just figure it out, you know. <laughs> and so thanks to Tom, I figured it out, and I I wrote an entire chapter you know, addressing exactly this question that Sharon, this mm. brilliant question that Sharon is posing. So there were legal loopholes that women knew about, how they 
came about this information. It, there were a variety of ways they came about this information, but they figured out that there were legal loopholes um, that allow for them to work around the limits of coverture. So coverture, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a legal doctrine which essentially says that when a property owning woman, um, whether she be single or widowed, remarries or marries, all of that property, all that wealth, if she earns wages, all of her wages become her husband's, right? Mm. So that's what coverture says. And so after that, you know, you would assume, well, women couldn't own, you know, they couldn't own slaves, they couldn't own, you know, anything, if that's the case. Um, well, they were because they, they took advantage of these legal loopholes. One of the legal loopholes that I found in, in the court records, consistently in the court records, were essentially like our prenups today. So just like prenuptial mm. agreements today, they had marital, what they called marital contracts then. Mm. And I mean, when I tell you they spelled out everything, they said, he can do this, he can't do that, he can't do that, he can't do that. This person has to come in. There was this one woman that said, when I write a will, I want three people in the room plus a, plus, plus, plus a priest, you know, if my husband is going to be there. You know, no, actually, I don't Ew. even want him there. So like they, <laughs> they, they were trying to make sure, you know, they, they use these, they manipulated the law. They use these, they use these loopholes. It's kind of like Trump. You know how Trump said, you know, like, I don't pay taxes because they don't let, they don't make me pay, pay taxes. They maybe pay taxes, I pay taxes. Very similarly, these women, mm. under, they learned about these loopholes in the laws that allow for them to secure property to themselves. Um, before marriage and even after marriage, there were even anti-nuptial agreements. These were um, basically prenuptial agreements that they entered into after they got married, particularly if they found out that their husbands were not who they said they were, you know, like they were, <laughs> I won't say that word. Um, they were, you know, you know, scoundrels. I'll say scoundrels. <laughs> the, the other word they were cheating. They were, yeah. Yes, they were, you know, they were scoundrels. And so, so that was one. The, sec the second really important one was, was when parents, you know, they said, oh God, he's a scoundrel. We don't want you marrying a scoundrel. So he'll take all the, all the family's wealth, all of your wealth that we, we grant to you. So we're going to build it. We'll, we'll build in uh, what's called a separate trust. We're going to create a separate trust for you. So mm -hmm. this is very much like our trust funds today, where you put a whole bunch of money, property, wealth, assets um, in a kind of legal bucket so to speak. And then you assign a trustee and you would assume that trustees would only be males, but they, they were with female um, mm -hmm. trustees. Some mothers um, served as trustees, aunts served as trustees, strange women served as trustees. Um, and then they would basically stipulate what kind of control or lack thereof that the, the husband could or you know could or could not have over this property. So those were two really important ways that women were able to use the loopholes built into the laws to get around coverture because in those those documents, in those legal instruments, what they were able to say is aside from you know what property what property he can touch and what property he can't touch is what can I do with my property? And so these mm. women would spell out in great detail, granular detail what they would be able to do with their property or not. And they, of course, they wouldn't put in there what they couldn't do. <laughs> so they put in <laughs> all these things that they could do with their property. And those were two of them really important ways that I show in the, in the, in the book, um, how they were able to get around the, the constraints, the legal constraints of coverture. And what I, I just, and this very quickly um, want to say is that, you know, of course, these men were just like, yeah, right. You know, they would, you know, try to impose upon these women. They would try to, mm -hmm. in, you know, um, to infringe upon their, their property rights. These women would go right into court, sue their husbands, okay? Damn. Even sue their husbands' creditors and win and win. Yeah. So I mean, again, I know they're you know, slave owners, but that's, that's, right, that's, right. that's, 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 they were, they were, they were fierce. These women were fierce, you know, yeah. as, as horrible as what they, you know, what they were involved in was, you know, slavery, they were fierce. And, and I think they, you know, I, I mean, I was impressed with their ability to use the laws and the economy um, in the ways that they did. I, you know, even, even as I was, you know, just astonished at their brutality, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But well, one thing that's interesting I'm just going to quick follow up. One thing that's no. interesting is if, if you've, you've probably, if people who are watching have probably read Laura Edwards' A Separate Piece or Dylan Penningrod's like Claims of Kinfolk, is that uh, African Americans also end up trying to use these loopholes in the law in the South as well. And that's sort of one of the coolest things about the law in the South is that it's not, it's not nationalized, it's not federalized, it's still developing in the 19th century. So just as much as white women are using the law, so are 
uh, enslaved people and then formerly enslaved people as well. And so that's that's one of the cool things about how white women get over coverture is that they they don't set the stage for it, but they sort of mm. help along the process of all different types of people to use the law and to sort of shape the law as being different. So, yeah. Sorry, Matt, go ahead. No, 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 that's fine. I, I was I was struck by what, what you were saying about like these white women being fierce because that that, that actually segues into another question that um that, that Jonathan asked it was about violence, is about how these white women used violence. And I and I think, you know, at least in my mind, like if I'm thinking about kind of pop culture representations, right? It's always the male um slave owner um who is who is it was kind of the 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 core of the violent attitude towards um the enslaved peoples. But you know, is that the case? Like, I mean, like, how did women act kind of violently? Like, was that a common kind of kind of common theme? You know, in the, you know the, the the cases that you were studying. Yeah. So that that too was a question that I had. You know, were they did they engage? Did these women engage in what we would consider to be a feminine form of mastery or mm. you know slave ownership? Yeah. And you know what I found was that no, <laughs> no, they did not. Mm. They used the same spectrum. Um, of of brutality and and punishment and discipline that white men did. Um, they you know were as innocuous those strategies and techniques were as innocuous as um, incentivized um, you know um, activity. So they would you know tell an enslaved person if you work a certain amount of you know a certain amount then you would get something and and you know as a reward for that. And then at the other op you know the opposite extreme was sadism. You know opposite extreme was you know mm -hmm. brutal br brutal um, violence. Um, and so you know what I was interested in is how did enslaved people um, understand white women's mastery. And so what was really interesting is, and, and if you look at the book titles, um, each of those, except for maybe one or two, are actual quotations from enslaved people mm. um, or from, from white women. And in the particular case of the chapter that deals specific, <laughs> specifically with um, white women's violence, it's the, the, the title is Mrs. Dunner on Boston. You know, and so this enslaved person is telling is is explaining how his married mistress. So she has a husband. She even has a son. So, so these two men could certainly take on the responsibility of of punishment and discipline, but she refused to allow them to do that, and she did it herself. And so he talks about how she 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 was a you know a, a good boss and well not a good boss but you know an effective boss um that you know she and and that how she would not let them interfere in the discipline and management of the enslaved people that she owned and th this is something that was recurring throughout the throughout the narratives throughout the interviews that um you know that white women um even even when they didn't actually um impose or perpetrate acts of violence with their own hands they would delegate that task just like white men did to their overseers, to drivers who are typically uh -huh. African enslaved African Americans who are also, um, you know, assigned the task of overseeing. Um, so they they would delegate the task in the same ways that white men did. Um, so okay. these were not feminine, um, feminine, um, you know, qualities at all to their mastery. And what I was really fascinated by was, well, if you know, they're saying that they <laughs> basically did the same things that their masters did. You know, why aren't they calling them masters? What are they, what are they calling them? And they, they called them mistresses. And so it was mm -hmm. e in their capacity as mistresses that they were able to exercise and wield this power. And so that, that forced me back to, again, the sources to see what, well, how, how is the law recognizing women's ability to exercise authority and control over enslaved people are they are they completely invisible in the law or are they are they being lumped into masters under masters in the law no if you look at the laws which i did for every southern state <laughs> um, they are they are listed there as having full authority to mm -hmm. eat, go up to maiming and killing enslaved people south carolina's laws say that mistresses can, um, if, if an enslaved person, you know, approaches them and don't, they don't have a, a ticket or a pass, which allows them to move freely um, from one place to another, that they can, you know, chase, chase them <laughs> and, and apprehend them. And if they refuse to be apprehended, they are off, off, far, um, authorized to, to maim or kill them. And so this is, this is constant throughout, this is kind of consistent throughout the laws um, in the South, mistresses as mistresses, 
are recognized as having the legal authority to perpetrate mm. acts of violence and to commit acts of violence against enslaved people up to murder uh, without penalty. That's the other thing, without penalty. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> we can wait for another episode of drunk drinking with, I was gonna say drunk <laughs> with a story. <laughs> I, I took one sip, I took one sip and I'm already sploshy, you know? <laughs> So, can I ask you just a very brief follow up? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, is that the kind of the, the the vector of authority is racial? It's not gender. Yes. Okay. That's a that's a brilliant way to put it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I I have a question just because slavery is for some reason consistently in the news as a as a topic of debate, as if it has as it does exist or doesn't exist. Uh, and this has been happening since the New York Times published the 1619 Project. But also recently, uh, President Biden decided to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And whether or not you have, you know, you're pro that or anti that or whatever you feel about that. Why do you think there is such a backlash to, to not just the 1619 Project, but also things like Juneteenth, things like bringing, talking about slavery in the public sphere? Like, why are Americans maybe specifically mm. some white Americans, so uncomfortable with it. What what does it sort of tell you as a historian or like about that? Like how how do you sort of respond to that? So, you know, many of our narratives, many of our national narratives are positive triumphant narratives. And we've become accustomed to to that at the K through 12 level, even, you know, you could say at the at the at the college level where the narrative that we are, we are given about our nation is a triumphant one, is a victorious one, is a positive one. Um, of, of course, many of us know that, <laughs> that that's not always the case, yeah. not always the case. Um, but when, when there is history that you know, diverges from that narrative, that, that tells us, a, a, a to, you know, that creates and crafts and reconstructs um, reconstructs that narrative in a way that seems to be a distortion, you get backlash. You know, I think, um, you know, it's like, I, I remember reading this book and I won't say the name. <laughs> I remember reading this book. And when I read it, I was just like, oh, I am like this book. I hate this book. I hate, I hate this book. <laughs> I kept putting it down like, oh, that is absolutely incorrect. I don't believe that at all. I don't, I, I don't feel that that's right. No, 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 no. And I remember describing it to that reaction to my professor. And I said, it felt like somebody put up a distorted mirror and showed me a distorted version of myself when I read that book. And I feel like these folks who are having such a kind of visceral reaction to discussions of, of slavery, to the, to the centering of slavery and the African-American experience in the national narrative, that they are, they feel as though, I, they feel like I did. You know, they feel that somebody yeah. is putting up a kind of one of those, you know, circus show, what do you call them? The freak show, not freak show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever that show is, you know, those mirrors at this, you know, the circus. Yeah, um, and they yeah. and they don't recognize themselves. They don't understand what yeah. they're seeing. And so, of course, you know, they're going to have this visual reaction because it's not recognizable. It's no longer recognizable to them. Um, it no longer censures them. It no longer shows them the way they want to be seen. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's like when I don't have makeup on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to see that version of myself. You know, get that version out of the way. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, so I think that's what's happening. I think that's yeah. really what's happening. And, you know, um, you know, recently I said, you know, I think it's important for us to teach this history though, because, um, you know, we can, if the, the more we teach, the more we come to understand these ugly elements of our history, the, the more comfortable we can become with talking about them, with reckoning with this past, with reckoning with what to mm. do next about this past. But if we, if we don't get that to that point, if we don't become comfortable you know, discussing, discussing this across the color line or whatever, across the class yeah. line, across the you know, um, generational line, then we're never going to get to a point where we can, yeah. we can talk about what next, where we can answer that question. Yeah. That's a really, I mean, it's a really interesting way. I love the way that you talked about it kind of uh, uh, as a, um, history as kind of a funhouse mirror, or it seems like kind of a funhouse mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Complete with props. Uh, yes. <laughs> 
Um, because I mean, it seems like like the political right. I mean, it's so much of their their political identity is based upon nostalgia, right? Like a heroic past that's been lost that needs to be kind of reclaimed in the present. And you know, like the, the redeemers deep, after the Civil War. Like the redeemers after the Civil War. I mean, the uh, you know, the, the kind of the easy example most recently, right? Is is uh, Trump's slogan, make America great again, right? Like it, there's, a, there's an object there, but it's an unclaimed object. Like you can kind of fill in what that blank space is. And, and what people have done is, is this heroic past, right? This, this, this unimpeachable founders, this, this triumphant narrative with the greatest nation on earth. We've never caused any faults or anything like that. People were products of their times, like kind of however you oh, yeah. say that. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like, I hate that line. I hate that yeah, line. Yeah, like, there's always somebody who complained about it. So let, let's talk about that. But anyway, that's, that's another whole thing. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, I love that, that kind of analogy. And, you know, like, the way that it's not that it doesn't seem like there's something like the 1619 project or, or, you know, any kind of kind of reckoning with the kind of the sins of America's past, for lack of a better um, phrase. It, it's just simply attempting to talk about the whole story rather than kind of a, a, a kind of a portion of the narrative. Um, and so like, like, how do you see this kind of kind of playing out? Like, because I think this is, and, and I guess my question is moving towards not just kind of um, university education, but K-12 education, right? Because a lot of, you yes. know, the debate, like I'm in, I'm, I'm in an Airbnb right now in Northern Virginia. I live in Southwestern Virginia. One of the epicenters of this is around here, like school boards like against kind of the teaching of kind of a, a, a more honest understanding of American history that reckons with its sins. So like, how do we, how do we as, as professional historians all kind of work with K-12 educators to make sure that, that an honest story, like a better story is actually out there? Well, I'm going to center UC Berkeley in this response because you know, no, Rachel Wein, Dr. Rachel Weinhart, the director of the UC Social Science Hist High School History Program um, and, and history program. I know I have the acronym all wrong, but we have a program here. <laughs> Suffice it to say, we have yeah. an extraordinary program here in-house where we work directly with K through 12 inst um, instructors who come from all over the country over the summers, you know, with, with funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we, we work with them. We, we give them lectures that kind of centers these stories. I've done it basically every year, except for this year. Um, and I think programs like that are gonna be central, um, whether they exist already or whether they're in the works, they need to exist. Um, because I think um, connecting um, these two kind of levels of education um, around these questions and around this history um, will I think revolutionize um, not radicalized, because you know some people are going crazy over there, and I'm sure it's, <laughs> it's the sneaky people. Um, revolutionize, you know, the curriculum, uh, the curricula of many of these um, K through 12, um, you know, schools. Um, but what I, but I, what I also think, what I, what I also want to underscore is that white women have a lot to do with this whole process, and they have had a lot to do. I'm bringing it back to the book. See how I did that? Um, <laughs> they have had a, a lot to do. Um, with this process from the very, very beginning. You know, I talk about at the end of the book, I talk about how, um, you know, after the war, women immediately began to write, um, you know, biography, autobiographies, biographies of their ancestors, um, talking, you know, basically re reimagining um, their relationship to slavery, reimagining white women's relationships to slavery. And we also know about the daughters of the Confederacy and the, you know, the roles that they played, not simply in, you know, memorial construction, but also in um, shaping the education of, of young people. Um, and there were, and there are, of course, other um, extraordinary books, one by Elizabeth McCray, uh, Mothers of Mass Resistance, a uh, massive resistance that talks about this process throughout the 20th century. So white women have been central to the kind of um, reshaping and shaping of, um, of the kind of educational narrative and the curricula curricula of, across the country um, in ways that have excluded this history. So we need to yet again look to white women and, and to and to and to ask them, you know, what roles are you playing yeah. in this process? Yet again, you know, um, I imagine that they're at the forefront of this process yet again <laughs> because why not? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I, you know, I, I am also, you know, kind of attentive to to that that interesting parallel um, and, and kind of parallel over time. Um, but yeah, but I think programs like what the, what we have here at, um, at Berkeley 
um, with uh, Dr. Rachel Reinhardt, um, you know, are really great resources for making sure that the newest scholarship about these issues um, is in the hands of K through 12 teachers. You know, where that that information can be then, um, you know, you know, um, taught to taught to the the, the young young folks. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of teaching uh one question that we like to ask a lot of guests is like when uh when you taught your class about history of women you use a lot of popular culture is there something that you is there like a movie about maybe not slavery in general but like african-american women or white women that like you hate to show or that you despise or is there a movie that you like you really love to show students like which would you rather talk about love to show students that like really represents the area. Oh, okay. Um, love to show students. Or that, that terribly misrepresents the area that becomes a kind of a useful pedagogical tool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I, I will, I'll tell you a, a hard mistake that I made this semester. Um, and it has, <laughs> it has nothing to do with, um, well, it does have something to do with women. Um, I, I also teach African American history, and so I taught the first half of the African American history survey, and you know I have a whole week on sexuality and slavery, because that's a really burgeoning field, yeah. um, and I, you know, and I use, and so I've taught this class several times before, and I've taught the film that I that I showed several times before as well. It was Mandingo. I don't know if you've ever seen Mandingo, mm. um, but I did show Mandingo. And so I showed Mandingo for this, I think the third or fourth time that I've taught this class and I've shown, shown it during that week. And it was just the worst. It was just the biggest bomb you can, you can oh, ever no. imagine because, you know, we did it on Amazon. And so I did like Amazon had this like watch party feature. And so, yeah. you know, I could just see people just going like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's you know the violence, the brutality, the it, there's incest, yeah. there's pedophilia, there's you know, and so it just it was just too much for them. Like they were like, "Look, lady, you know, <laughs> pandemic and mandingo, you gotta be kidding me! I'm out of here!" You know, so don't do that. Don't do that. You know, and it was difficult because I couldn't pause, you know, and kind of talk them yeah. through little parts, which is what I typically do in the classroom. So like. Oh, it was just, and it made me, I was just like talking about it for like at least a week. And my husband was just like, can you stop talking about that by now? You probably <laughs> already moved on to something else, you know, like some other crisis in their lives, you know, like forget it, you know, but yeah. So like, I, you know, sometimes like every, everything can't be rosy, you know, so I figured I would share a, a hard, <laughs> hard experience with y'all. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, there's sometimes, I mean, like, I mean, I think we've all kind of had that experience, right? Is that there's something that we think is really going to work in a classroom, like a, like a TV episode or a movie or, or even like, like a certain lecture. And it's just like, just goes over like rocks and it's just like, what yeah. happened? I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. And then trying to recover from that, I think it could be, could be, could be very difficult sometimes. So, yeah, I just gave up on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take the opposite you know? approach in my classes. I show movies that are like wildly inaccurate, and then I like, like I like debunk them, okay. and that's that, that's mm. fun. Or or movies that are like ironically accurate that are fun. So like you know, if I like during this, I don't know if I'll be able to teach during this semester, but like uh, in previous classes, I've been able to show a couple of clips of like Death of Stalin. We talked about this last week, and oh, so, yeah, like, my that. students love that. Or uh, I'll show them like you did this uh, when we taught when you taught your class. I show them when I teach the early American history survey. I show them clips of Pocahontas, Disney's Pocahontas, just to like make fun of Pocahontas, but also because in Pocahontas there's this amazing line that I like to you know I like to quote a lot in my sections when I teach is like these white people they're dangerous and like it's, <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> on a t-shirt. I, don't know. I remember when I first took the U.S. history survey, I literally printed a clip of that line and I used it as the background for the holiday card I gave my GSI because nice. I love that line. That line represents all of the early U.S. history for me. It's so true. So, yeah. It's like the theme yeah. of like a Western Civ course exactly. right there. Yes, it exactly. is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> These white people, yeah. they're dangerous. <laughs> 600 what? BCE. To 19, you know, <laughs> like to 2020. the movie is wildly inaccurate about Pocahontas, it about is. British people, about everything. But yeah. like that one line, you're just like, mm. it's very accurate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, changing topics slightly, um, okay. we do have a question. Um, we mentioned at the very beginning kind of the, the WPA um, narratives. 
And so uh, Mike asks, like for somebody who's kind of unfamiliar, like how do you kind of how do you kind of work with that? Because it's a vast archive. And if you're unfamiliar with those sources, like if, if somebody wanted to kind of take a look at these and, and look for different things, like like you have any kind of suggestions about how to how to work with that particular source. So when I first started working with them, they were just all published books. <laughs> it's like okay this is gonna be this is gonna take a while yeah. you know and so towards the end of the the writing the researching and the writing they became digitized I mean it totally Damn. transformed my research so now you know just the average person if you're not even affiliated with the university library you have access to them on the library of congress's website they're they're all there in one place and what I think is what what I think is um one of the few things that few facts that people don't know is that it also includes audio recordings of some of the interviewees and wow. photos. So wow. in my book, I use two photos, but they're, they're photos of the interviewees yeah. and there are audio recordings that are there for free that you can access. And so, you know, this is extraordinary for your classes. If you're a K through 12 teacher, if you're in the under, you know, in the university system, um, wonderful resources that are accessible for free and if you're a part of the university system then of course they have the published um you know all the volumes uh and they also have um many of their at least two databases that have did the digitized interviews and so the why are the digitized ones really important because you can actually search for specific terms so if you're interested in for example i you know have a a, a, a student that I'm, I'm working with now that's really interested in conjuring and, and voodoo you can actually oh. search those terms and you can find all of the narratives where those terms come up but uh, but what's also interesting <laughs> is that what if what if you realize for example the the term wet nursing doesn't come up quite often in the narratives. And that's because enslaved people used other terms to describe that oh, practice. Yeah. So it allows for you to understand what their vernacular is, what their lexicon is around a particular subject. So you begin to kind of develop a whole series of search terms that you can then use to find even more narratives. So I think it's just a really extraordinary thing. I, I consider the digitization of archives, the democratization of archives, because mm -hmm. people who can't go to Q, <laughs> you know, or can't afford yeah. to pay, pay for the document can actually access those documents, yeah. you know. It's been a stunning development, especially during the pandemic, right? With the yeah. fact that these things are really available. I mean, so many, like, you know, as a medievalist, right? So many manuscripts are now digitized. Like you can actually look at these things. You don't have to be in Germany or England or anything like that. Exactly. It allows this kind of scholarship. To, and like you said, it, it's democratizing. Like anybody can look at these. Yes, like these are, these are so many of these are freely available. It's, it's really it's wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I have one last question. It's sort of a silly question, but I think it's really important. Jamie asks, uh, because she's also a famous uh, or a very uh, important makeup person for me online, as well as I am. She asked, what, <laughs> where did you get your lipstick? Where did you get your lipstick shade? She didn't ask where I got my lipstick shade. So while you look for yours, I will tell Jamie, mine is Pat McGrath's Deep Orchid. It's brand new and it's gorgeous. I love it. But we should listen, ask Stephanie where she got hers. I think mine is Maybelline. Color Ooh. sensational, okay, <laughs> and it's vibrant violet. Let's see, let me see. Yeah, there you go. Yes, okay, Perfect. okay. There's just been there's just been this really annoying discussion online. Some people should just not be online of like what it means to be a modest academic. And like this this woman is like telling women online about like how to dress and stuff. Oh. And I was like, don't do this. No, <gasps> that's my favorite. That's my favorite kind of conversation because oh, I'm no. a black woman and everywhere I go on the Berkeley campus I'm visible I'm hyper visible so mm -hmm. what do I look like hiding from anybody by wearing oh wearing, I mean I have one black today but you see I have shoulders showing see that shoulder very <laughs> immodest very <laughs> immodest okay so like I just you know I came to this conclusion even before tenure that you know I'm hyper visible on mm -hmm. campus people are going to see me no matter how much I try to hide. So why hide? So if you see me, I have color. I'm just, you know, colorful, colorful clothes, colorful, you know, colorful lipstick, you know, all that because I can't hide even if I try. So I don't, I don't want to be, I mean, I'm modest in some ways, but I don't want to be modest in other ways, in the, the ways that she's probably talking about. So, you know, I, I say, 
I say embrace your creativity, embrace your embrace your identity and, and your your the way you want to express it, like and however you want. You know, I, I mean, I have a, a an amazing student that has the most gorgeous neon pink hair, and I love it. And I tell her just do it. And I've seen purple and blue and all that tattoos. I'm, I mean, I'm completely tatted. So, this thing. I'm just gonna say my first semester of grad school. I uh, initially I I love wearing makeup, and so like I would wear makeup a lot during my my classes with uh, Professor uh, McClendon, my U.S. History survey. And like sometimes people would be like, "Are you going somewhere? What's happening?" Blah blah blah. But then you came in because you were presenting your manuscript before it was published. It was in early 2017, and you were like wearing this bright pink lipstick, and I was like, you know what? I don't care what people think. I'm gonna be wearing bright lip pink lipstick every day. So and just that's like you why said, I thought it was important yeah. to ask the question. Absolutely. I mean, I I just I think I think we should we should we should be who we want to be, our authentic selves in 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 our spaces. Because you know, then you then you're gonna then you're gonna really regret not being who you really wanted to be and mm-hmm. your authentic self in those spaces. You you just, you know. I mean, I, next time I hope, Matt, you have like a a hot pink, you know, tie <laughs> or something. <laughs> get some red, get some red glasses, you know. I got red yes. glasses, blue glasses. I got all kinds of colors. I'm know? usually wearing like a Golden Girls t-shirt. So, I mean, this is, this is quite a difference okay. for me. So okay, okay. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. We have a whole bunch of questions in the Q&A that we just don't have time um, to get to. Um, but this has been... Uh, you we can should tweet follow... at us or tweet at Stephanie and like... You know, Stephanie. Might Go have follow time. Stephanie she might have time. right now. Yes. Yes. That's right. yes. yes, absolutely. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Join us. Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we'll be back. Uh, I don't think we'll be back next week because it's the, the holiday um, weekend, but we'll be back the week after that. So uh, please look on the website, drinkinghistorians.com, for, for our schedule there. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And have a wonderful um, weekend. And from a secure location, let me simply say cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.